Well, good morning and uh, welcome to our service this morning by way of live stream. We're so happy that you could join us. Our scripture reading this morning is from Joshua chapter 2, verses 8 through 14. <clears throat> Before the men lay down, she came up to them on the roof and said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land and that the fear of us the fear of you has fallen upon us and that all the inhabitants of the land melt away before you for we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan to Sihon and Og whom you devoted to destruction and as soon as we heard it our hearts melted and there was no spirit left in any man before you, or because of you. <clears throat> For the Lord your God, he is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. Now then, please swear to me by the Lord that as I have dwelt <coughs> kindly with you, you also will de deal kindly with my father's house and give me a sure sign that you will save, that you will save alive my father and mother my brothers and sisters, and all who belong to them, and deliver our lives from death. And the men said to her, Our life for yours, even to death. If you do not tell, the, tell this business of ours, then when the, king, the Lord gives us the land, we will deal kindly and faithfully with you. Let us pray. <clears throat> our Heavenly Father, on this day we praise you, Lord knowing that you are intimately acquainted with our ways and that you always love us and have our best interests at heart. We please allow your face to shine on us and, great, and be gracious to us. We pray that you will be our guard against all that threatens our peace. Please bless us and protect us. For this is our prayer in, our name, in the name of our Savior, Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat> I want to share with you very briefly all the songs we're singing this morning are songs about hope. Hope is a good thing. 1 Corinthians 13 and 13 tells us that hope stills abide. We, we still have hope. This virus has got our, uh, our hearts and our minds thinking maybe a little in the downward direction. The political landscape's got us thinking this way. Being isolated, a lot of us extroverts miss hugging people, miss seeing people, and, that, and that's hard on, on some of us folks. But we still can have hope. I remember reading in Daniel where he talks about a kingdom that's coming that will never be destroyed. And that's the kingdom of God, and it's here, and we're members of it, and it will never be destroyed. No matter what the destination the journey of our life is on. Hope makes this journey a better trip. Hope makes the journey a better trip. Let's pray. Father, we come to you thanking you for the many blessings of life that you give us. Thanking you for all that you love us. Thanking you for the many ways you care for us. And thank you for the many blessings you pour out on us every day. Father, there's a lot of things that we're dealing with in our minds and in our hearts these days, things that uh, creep in and cause us to have bad thoughts, things that creep in and causes us to have depression, things that creep in that causes us to feel bad about certain things. Father, I pray that we can look to you in our hearts, searching for that hope, looking for that hope, hoping these things will be better. I pray that we can have hope that this virus will end, that the vaccinations will work, that the people on the front lines are doing the best things they can do to combat the virus. Father, I pray for hope to be instilled in our hearts because of the political landscape. We know that you are the King of all kings, the Lord of all lords, and your kingdom will stand forever. We can have hope in that we can have assurance in that blessed assurance 
And Father, I pray for those of us that are feeling lonely, those of us that are missing our brothers and sisters, or missing the routine, or missing church, or missing Sunday school. We hope these things can turn around and we can put our hope and our trust and our faith in you. We know hope still abides. Be with us this morning, Father, as we worship, as we pour out our hearts to you in song, with our thoughts, with our minds. Pray that you'll be with Mark as he brings a message to us. <clears throat> May we open our hearts and minds to learn more about your word and more about how you would have us to be. Bless our congregation, Father, our family, our friends. There are many sick. There are many dealing with a lot of serious issues. I pray for your mercy and your grace and your healing upon them. Thank you most of all for the blood of Jesus and that great sacrifice. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Good to see all of you this morning. We appreciate so much those who are joining our worship live stream today. Whether you are on Facebook or whether you are on Zoom, we are so appreciative that you have joined us as we go to God and worship Him this morning. If you have your Bible with you where you are, I would invite you just to hold it up and keep it up as we always do. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the Word of the Lord endures forever. Join me this morning in Joshua chapter 2, as Steve read for us just a few minutes ago. As we journey through the book of Joshua, as we think about how to be strong and courageous, we come to a story in Joshua 2 this morning about two spies and a prostitute. Now, that may sound like a bad joke to you, but that really is what this text is all about. It is all about two spies and a prostitute named Rahab. It is a, it is a great, great story. I would encourage you, if you haven't read it lately, go home. and Well, you are home, right? Sometime this afternoon, read Joshua chapter 2 and, 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 and get this story in your mind. Let me hit some of the high points of it for you uh, this morning, just in case you haven't seen it or read it lately. Two spies, two spies from the nation of Israel go into the land of Canaan. They go to the city of Jericho where uh, they're about to go and attempt to take this city. They're sent in to spy out and to see what they can see. They no sooner get to the city when they have to hide because they, they fear for their life. This prostitute named Rahab hides these two spies and helps them escape. And in return for her faith and her faithfulness, they pledge to her, when we come and take the city, we're going to deal kindly with you and with all who are in your house. It really is a neat story. And you, and you could look at it and approach it from several different angles. But this morning, I specifically want us to look at this story and ask the question, how can we gain strength? How can we gain courage? and confidence and hope from this text about these two spies and this prostitute named Rahab. Uh, there's so much there I think God wants us to hear. Now, if you're fully, going to fully appreciate what's going on in this chapter, I think you have to understand the background. And that is, this is not the first time that Israeli spies have gone into the land of Canaan to spy out the land. They had tried this 40 years earlier, and they had failed miserably. And they paid a steep price for their lack of faith. See, 40 years before this, they had sent 12 spies into the land of Canaan. And when they got into the land, man, they found people who were big. They found people who were strong, cities that were fortified. And 10 of those spies came back and they said, hey... There is no reason for us to go forward with this any further. We can't take this land. We can't win, win against these people. We're done. Two of the spies, Joshua and Caleb, said, What do you mean we can't? God has already said, I'm going to give you the land. It's yours. Just go take it. Hey, we need to go tomorrow and do what God has told us to do. Well, because of their lack of faith... God said to the Israelites, For 40 years, you're going to wander in the wilderness 
until this entire generation dies off. All of you who saw me bring you out of Egypt with great power and great signs and great strength, all of you who saw that and yet forgot about my faithfulness and forgot about my power and forgot that I could lead you through anything, that whole generation is going to die off. Your children will enter into this new land. And so this spy thing has happened before. Now they send two new spies into the land of Canaan. Now, I don't know what the Israelites would have been thinking, but I know what I would have been tempted to be thinking. I would have been thinking, man, we, we sent a group of guys 40 years ago in to do this, and they blew it, and they messed up badly. I sure hope these guys get it right, right? I wonder, have you, have you ever failed at something, maybe failed miserably, but then you got another chance. Maybe it was a business venture and you just fell flat on your face, or maybe it was some family matter, or, or maybe it was a relationship and, and you just blew it and you just failed and you fell flat on your face, but then you had another opportunity down the line to make up for it, to say, I'm going to do better this time. I am not going to make the same mistake that I made before. That's exactly where the Israelites are. And I think all of us can identify with the fact that they probably would have been a little bit afraid that maybe they're going to mess up the second time too. I want you to think with me this morning about three lessons we learn from these two spies and this prostitute named Rahab. Three lessons that will help us get strength and courage and confidence and hope for the future, even though we may have messed up royally and blown it badly in the past. Here's the first thing I want you to notice from the text that will give us confidence and that will give us hope. We can have confidence because of God's favor and God's faithfulness. When we're a little bit afraid because we've done this before and we failed, uh, we're afraid we may blow it again, we don't know whether we ought to try it again, we can have confidence and we can have hope because of God's favor and God's faithfulness. I want you to think about Rahab for just a minute. She really is an amazing woman. She's not only mentioned here in Joshua 2, but three times in the New Testament, she is called a great woman of faith. And yet, the Bible says she's a harlot. She's a prostitute. And, and we read that and we go, wait, wait a minute, she's a, she's a what? God used whom to do what? Uh, God often uses the least likely people, at least from the way we would look at it, to carry out his purposes. And that certainly was the case with this woman named Rahab. Look at what it says again in Joshua 2, down in verse 8. It says, Before the men, these two spies, lay down, Rahab came up to them on the roof, and look at what she said to them. She said, I know. Remember, before we read the rest of this, this is not a Jew. She is not an Israelite. She is not a part of God's chosen people. She, she is a Canaanite. She is a, a pagan. That's been her background. And yet look at what she says. She says, I know that the Lord has given you this land and that the fear of you has fallen upon us and that all the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. Look at the confidence she gives them. And it's definitely what we might call outsider confidence, right? I mean, I, I don't know about you, but if I had been in this situation and I was trying to get a little confidence as we're about to go in and take the land, I would have much rather have had the captain of, of the, the Jericho army come out and say, man, we're scared to death of y'all. That might have given me some confidence. Or maybe the mayor or, or the city council, right, from Jericho coming out and saying, hey, we're scared to death of y'all. We got no chance to beat y'all. That might have given me some confidence. But that's not what God does. Uh, God chooses this woman, this Canaanite woman, this prostitute, to come out and say, hey, this land, it is yours. You got to trust me on this. <laughs> that's pretty amazing to me. 
it would sort of be like uh, you know, the, our football team here in, in Athens, our high school football team, the Men County Cherokees. Let's say the Cherokees are going to go play a football game on a Friday night, and they're traveling somewhere to play, and, and they get on the bus, and they head to the stadium, and they get to the stadium where they're going to play, and they get off the bus, and they go into the visiting locker room. And there in the locker room, there's this, this seventh-grade boy filling up the bottles, you know, the water bottles with Gatorade or whatever it is that they do, you know, getting ready for the game. And, and this little seventh grade boy looks at, at, at Coach Cagle and says, man, Coach Cagle, we're scared to death of y'all. We ain't got no chance of beating y'all tonight. Now, that might make you feel a little bit good, but I don't know about you, but I'd rather that confidence come from somebody besides a little seventh grade boy filling up water bottles, right? That's, that might not inspire that much confidence in me. And yet, these two spies took this as a sign from God that God was trying to tell them something, even through this outsider named Rahab, and they, they thought, man, we need to listen to what she is saying. God will often use outsiders to tell you you're doing a good job or to keep on keeping on or maybe you need to try this or maybe you need to try that again. I can give you an example of that from my, my own experience in my own life. Um, several years ago, I decided, you know, I'm going to try to use social media, especially Facebook, for something besides keeping up with family, keeping up with, with friends and acquaintances in other places. I want to try to use Facebook as a means to encourage people and to, to reach out with the message of Jesus. And so I began to do some videos, different, different formats, different, different things. And, you know, as, as that rocked along, it got to a point where I thought, you know, I'm not sure that I really need to keep doing this because I just don't think it's having the impact that I think it ought to be having. But... So many people reached out and said, hey, Mark, we, we really appreciate what it is that you're doing. We appreciate these videos. They're encouraging. They're helpful in, in, our, in our relationship with the Lord and in learning about him. Uh, boy, I'm glad you're doing them. Please keep doing them. Now, a lot of those people were a part of my church family here in Athens. But let me tell you what, just as many or maybe even more of those people were not a part of my church family. They were people from somewhere else. They were outsiders, if you will. And man, that gave me quite a lot of confidence. God will often use people to say, hey, keep on going. Listen to what they say. It doesn't always have to be somebody in your circle. It doesn't always have to be somebody who's really influential. It could be somebody else. Sometimes God can give us the best encouragement from outsiders. So here are these Israelites. Here are these two spies. And maybe they're a little bit afraid because they've blown it before. I mean, the last thing they want is 40 more years of wandering in the wilderness because they mess it up, right? That's the last thing they want. You know, no matter how many times sometimes that we've been told something, we often have a hard time believing it. No matter how many times you've been told Hey, God loves you. We're, we're so tempted sometimes to think, yeah, yeah, but you don't know all the bad things that I've done. And you don't know all the mistakes that I've made in my past. Even though we know, that, and God has told us that it's true, we have a hard time believing it. I want you to look at these words in Romans chapter 8, verses 35 through 39. Paul says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. God says, I know you've messed up. 
I know you have failed miserably before, but I want you to hear what I am saying to you. I want you to have confidence and hope in what I'm trying to tell you. See, one of the reasons that we can have confidence and hope in God's favor is because of God's past faithfulness. Did you notice in Joshua 2, that's one of the the things that Rahab said to these two spies. She said, listen, we've heard about what God did for you in Egypt. We heard how he parted the Red Sea. We heard how you walked across on dry ground. We've heard how God gave you victory after victory over all these kings and all these nations. She remembered God's faithfulness. And yet, you contrast that with what the, the, the ten spies did 40 years earlier. You remember them? They got to the promised land. They had seen every plague in Egypt. They had seen the Red Sea part. They had walked across on dry ground. Think about it. They had seen God feed them with manna in the wilderness every single day. And yet, they got to the edge of the promised land, and they forgot God's faithfulness in the past. And they said, nope, we can't do this. Listen, we can have confidence and hope in God's favor because of God's past faithfulness. And sometimes that hope and sometimes that confidence can even come from an outsider like Rahab was. I think there's something else we learn from this story in this text that can give us confidence and strength and courage and hope as we think about the future, and that is we can have confidence because of God's grace. God's grace has great implications for our lives. Sometimes, here's what happens, sometimes when we're afraid and we feel bad about our past failures, we think, man, I've failed before, what if I fail again? Sometimes we make the mistake of comparing ourselves with someone else that we think is less than us. Now, that doesn't happen in the story in Joshua 2, but that often happens in our lives. Sometimes, to make ourselves feel better, we'll we'll say things to ourselves like, Yeah, yeah, sure, God does love me. Sure, He loves me. I went to church this week. I logged on to a live stream. I opened my Bible and I read my Bible every day this week. Sure, God loves me. I I reached out and I helped somebody this week. Yes, I know God loves me. It's so easy for us to compare because we can always find somebody else and say, hey, that that guy over there, I don't think he went to church this week. Don't think he logged on to a live stream. Don't know if he even owns a Bible, let alone reads it. But notice in this story, there's no comparison. These two spies don't say, hey, We're Israelites, and you're a Canaanite prostitute. We're special people. There's none of that here. In fact, the interesting thing to me that stands out in this story is, this story is not even about the spies being successful in their mission, right? I mean, they're sent into the land to spy out the land. That's their job. But they no sooner get into the land than they got to hide because the king's looking for them. He hears that they're there, and he's going to take their life. And so they don't, as far as spying out the land or scouting out the land, man, that was useless. They didn't do any spying. They didn't do any scouting. But that wasn't the purpose, really, from God's perspective, of this trip at all. The whole story of the spies going to Jericho wasn't really about spying out the city. It was so that God could give them confidence in the face of their fear could give them hope in the face of their fear. And he was going to use somebody to do that that they would have been tempted to consider as less than themselves. But they were not going to look down their noses at her. They were not going to come in and say, hey, this is who we are, this is what we've got, and this is what we're going to do. No. It wasn't about the spies being successful. This story was about God getting a message to them through this prostitute named Rahab that says, this is your land. God is giving it to you, and you need to have confidence that this is happening. And God used Rahab, of all people, to do that. You remember in the Bible the story of a man named Gideon? 
That's not a story we talk about very often, but look him up and read about him this week. His story is amazing. God comes to this, this farmer named Gideon, and he says, Gideon, I want you to lead my army into battle against the enemy. <laughs> and Gideon basically says, God, you got, I'm a farmer. I don't know anything about leading armies into battle. You've got the wrong guy. And God says, no, I've got the right guy. What I want you to do, Gideon, is go, go find some men, gather some men, and go fight this war. And Gideon, Gideon does what I would have been tempted to do and what you would have been tempted to do. Gideon says, all right, Lord, but how do I know you're really with me? And how do I know you're really going to protect me? Give me a sign, right? Well, God plays along with him. God's so patient. God goes along with what Gideon is doing. Uh, Gideon says, okay, God, here's what I want you to do. Uh, I'm going to put out this fleece. Maybe you've heard of this part. Gideon's the guy that did this. He put out this fleece, this rug, if you will, outside of his tent one night. And he says, okay, God, here's the deal. If you're really with me, then in the morning when I get up, if, if the fleece is wet and the ground all around it is dry, then I'll know you're with me. Well, guess what God does? He does exactly that. Gideon gets up in the morning. It was exactly the way he had asked God to do it. That's the way it was. <laughs> so Gideon said, all right, Lord, let's go. No, Gideon is just like you and me. Gideon says, all right, Lord, one more time. If I get up tomorrow morning, <laughs> and, and he reversed it so that, you know, I guess make, to make sure God is with him, he reversed it and says, all right, if I get up in the morning and, and everything else is wet around it, but the fleece is dry, then God, I'll know you're with me. And again, God does exactly that for Gideon. He gives him that sign. But then there's something else that isn't maybe as well known as the whole fleece thing. God says to Gideon, Gideon, I want you to go and sneak into the camp of the enemy. And when you get there, I want you to just listen. That's all I want you to do, I want you to just go and listen. So Gideon sneaks into the enemy camp. And there are a couple of soldiers that are there talking. One soldier says to the other, hey, I had this, this dream. I dreamed that this loaf of bread, this giant loaf of bread rolled down off the hill and just wiped out all of our tents. What in the world does that mean? Listen, I would have had any idea what that means. But this other soldier, while Gideon is listening, says to the guy who had the dream, he says, oh, I know exactly what that means. This, this is the enemy soldier, right? He says, I know exactly what that means. Gideon is like that loaf of bread, and he's just going to roll in here, and he's going to wipe us out. We are in big, big trouble. And the Bible says Gideon got confidence and hope from that, that he was going to be able to lead and that God was going to give him success. See, we've got a challenge. We're challenged by God's grace to listen to those around us. This wasn't about the spies being successful. This was about God being successful. And God, in his grace, chose of all people Rahab to give them hope and confidence and courage. And she found mercy and grace because she was willing to help these two spies. Listen, the grace of God ought to forever put an end to me thinking that I am better than anyone else. And it should do that for you too. We can't look at anyone else and say, hey, I am better than you because. No. You didn't do anything to earn God's goodness. You, you didn't do anything to earn your way into His grace. You didn't do anything to make God love you. So you don't have a right to ever look down your nose at anyone else as if you're better than them. Here's Rahab, right? The lowest of the low. And she's in the lineage of Jesus. And she's mentioned in the New Testament as a great woman of faith. We can have confidence, we can have hope because of God's grace and its implications for our lives. And then there's one more thing I think we learn from this text in this story relative to strength and courage and confidence and hope and how we can have that with everything, as Robbie mentioned earlier, man, with everything that's going on in our world, where do we find all these things? We can find it ultimately because of God's covenant sign. 
his covenant sign. What do you mean, Mark? I mean, they had a covenant sign in Joshua 2. We have a covenant sign. Rahab says to these, these two spies, listen, I need y'all to give me a sure sign that when you come and attack this city, you'll deal kindly with me and with my family. I need you to give me a sure sign, and I love what the spies say to her in verse 14. They said to her, I love this phrase. We're going to come back to it in a minute. Our life for yours, even to death, if you do not tell this business of ours, then when the Lord gives us this land, we'll deal kindly and we will deal faithfully with your, our life for yours. They made a covenant with her right there. If you will put your life on the line for us, then we will put our lives on the line for you, our life for yours. They go on to tell her, you put this scarlet cord outside of your window. And when we come and attack the city and we see this scarlet cord hanging out of that window, we will spare everyone in that house. And you know what's really interesting to me in the story? Man, these spies, she helps them out the window, she helps them escape. No sooner are they gone, and before they're even completely out of sight, you know what Rahab does? She goes and hangs that scarlet cord in that window. <laughs> she is, she's not waiting for Joshua and the armies to come and surround the city and start marching around the city. And then she thinks, hey, I, I guess I need to go put that scarlet cord. No, she says, where's the cord? Give me the cord. I'm going to go put this outside of my window. We're, we've made a covenant, and I'm going to keep that covenant. A scarlet cord. Think about that for a minute. A scarlet cord. Everybody in the house where the scarlet cord is lives. You know what that sounds like to me? Do you remember the Passover in the Old Testament? As they are in Egypt and, and, and Moses told the people, you put the blood of the lamb over the doorpost and when the death angel comes and that blood is there, he'll pass over and spare you. Scarlet cord. You know what else that sounds like? It sounds like us. Our covenant sign is the blood of Jesus, as we sang about earlier, the blood of Jesus covering our lives. Scarlet cord, Jesus' scarlet blood. The blood of Jesus says, my life for yours. My life for yours. He's given my life, he's given his life for me. He's given his life for ours, and now ours are to be given to him in return. Paul puts it this way in Titus 2 in verse 14. Speaking of Jesus, it says that he gave himself for us to redeem us from lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. You know what Paul's saying in that passage and what other passages just like it are saying? Jesus is saying, my life for yours. I will give you my life. And in return, I ask for your life. All of it. That's my covenant with you. That's the swap that we're going to make. My life for yours. And when you're faced with a choice then of, man, am I going to make the same mistake that I've made in the past? Am I going to fail like I failed in the past? Notice what Rahab doesn't do. Rahab does not let her past and the kind of person she had been disqualify her from helping in the present. She doesn't look at the spies and say, well, guys, I'd love to help y'all. I really would. But you have no idea how, how bad my reputation is. And you have no idea how many mistakes I've made in the past. And you have no idea who I am and who I've been. No, she doesn't let her past failures stop her from doing what God wants her to do. She's a woman who has faith enough to know God was with you in the past. God will be with you in the future. So, do you need some confidence this morning? Do you need some strength? Do you need some courage? Do you need some hope? Well, when you're afraid of the future, when you're afraid maybe of failure because you've messed up in the past, you can have confidence and hope because of God's favor and His past faithfulness. 
And you can get that confidence from people around you. Maybe people you would never expect to get it from. Maybe someone says to you, hey, I'm praying for you. And you never would have expected to hear that from them. You can gain confidence and hope because of God's grace and its implications for your lives. Hey, you don't need uh, the most spiritual person in the world from your perspective praying for you, right? I mean, think about Rahab. We gain confidence because of God's grace. And then we can have confidence and hope because of God's covenant sign. Jesus says to you, I love you. Well, Lord, how do, you, how, do I, how do I know you love me? I gave my life for you. My life for your life. I will swap with you. I lay down my life for you. You give me yours in return. So have you given your life to Jesus? All of it. He didn't want 90% of it. He doesn't even want 99% of it. He wants all of your life. There's no, there's no 99% in, you know. Hey, I'm, I'm 99% in. No, there's none of that. It's all in. Have you given your life to Jesus? If the answer to that is no for you, friend, please message me this week. Let me tell you how you can give your life to Jesus. He has given his life for you. Will you give him your life in return? Message me. I want to help you know how to do that. If you need me to just need us to just pray with you this week, send me a message. We would love to do that. I know it's tough right now. We need confidence and we need strength and we need courage and we need hope and we can find it. If Rahab could find it, hey, if these two spies could find it, we can find it. I'd love to pray with you. Let me know what we can do this week as far as that goes. Let's pray together as we as we wrap up our lesson this morning. Father, thank you for this reminder of where hope truly is found. Father, you know where our hearts are this morning. You know where we are, our minds, our attitudes. God, what we're feeling, the struggles that we're going through. Father, I pray you would use your word this morning to bring us hope, and to bring us strength, and courage, and confidence because of who you are, because of what you've done in the past, because of what you've done in sending Jesus and what you promised to do for your people in the future. We pray it today in Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead and get out your communion elements as one of our shepherds, James Summers, comes and leads us in our thoughts about Jesus. I once heard a quote from a preacher it goes something like this, for the believer, excuse me, for the unbeliever, this earth is as close as they'll ever get to heaven. For the believer, this earth is as close as we'll ever get to hell. And sometimes life can be a bit hellish and difficult and hard. I appreciate the lesson that Mark gave us this morning. I encourage us all to be courageous and stand strong because of what Jesus did for us and the hope that we have in him. So as we uh, partake of the elements this morning, I pray that you would join me in prayer and that you'd be able to focus on the cross and what that means. Heavenly Father, it is with humble hearts that we bow before you this morning, confessing to you, Father, that sometimes life is difficult here, and sometimes it's hard for us to remember what Jesus has done for us. And the fact that the things that he's done for us is permanent and can never be taken away. Thank you that he came to this earth, lived and died and conquered the grave so that we might have hope of eternal life with you. Help us to remember, Father, the day that he, that he did that and was sacrificed on that cruel cross and the fact that we should have been there. Bless this bread as we partake of it and us as we partake. In Jesus' name, amen. Father, we continue in prayer to you this morning, being reminded that 
the price that was paid for us was the blood of your son. And for that, we are thankful. We thank you for this, this uh, cup that reminds us of that blood. Thank you for the power that's there that allows us to have true hope. Thank you for the fact that we can know for sure that your son conquered the grave and is there with you now preparing a place for each of us. We look forward to that. We just pray that you would bless this cup as we partake of it. In Jesus' name, amen. Again, thank you all so much for joining us this morning as we've worshipped God together. Before we dismiss today, we want to mention just a few things that we need to keep in mind as a church family this week. Uh, we will be sending out the prayer list later this afternoon with many people that we need to be praying for. Let me mention just a couple of things uh, along those lines really quickly. Um, keep Joe Pitney in your prayers. Joe has improved some. And they're still trying to figure out exactly what the nature of his infection is. And hopefully, uh, Joe will be able to go home either today or tomorrow. Uh, we will let you know more about that as, as uh, details become available. Also, we would ask you to remember uh, Ross Herod in your prayers. Ross is, of course, one of our shepherds here in Athens. He was scheduled to have gallbladder surgery this week. Uh, that surgery has been postponed. Uh, in lieu of a biopsy that they will be doing this week. Uh, so please keep Ross and Carolyn in your prayers. Tonight, don't forget, we will be doing Overflow at around 5 o'clock, both on Facebook, on the church's Facebook page, and also on, uh, on YouTube. So be looking for that as we dive a little bit deeper into Joshua 2 and how we can apply that this week. Also, this Wednesday night at 7 on Zoom, we'll be having a time of prayer and the Word, and we would encourage you, if you possibly can, uh, to join us for that. One other thing I want to remind you of, the plan is, uh, provided nothing changes with uh, local virus cases in McMinn County, we plan to reassemble with in-person worship only. Uh, no, no Bible classes or any of that just yet, but uh, we do plan to go back to in-person worship next Sunday at 1030. Of course, we will still have our live stream available both on Zoom and on Facebook, so do make note of that. Uh, we'd love to see you next Sunday, whether it's in person or whether it's virtually. We're grateful uh, for all of you that are here today. Uh, join me in prayer, and we will, be, we will be dismissed today. Father, again, thank you for this morning. Thank you for this time of worship. I pray, God, you would be with, with each, each one who has joined us today, that, God, you would remind them that you are still on the throne, that you would remind them you are still who you say you are, you are still God, and you are still in control. Help us, God, this week to live with strength and courage, to live with confidence and hope because of who you are. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Y'all have a blessed week.